Before we get into the episode, I just had to pop on here and say I'm so sorry for the horrible audio on my end. Uh, Alex Legassi was very professional with his setup, but um, I had just the way that schedules worked and stuff, I was not able to be in my normal spot uh, during the recording, so the audio is a little bit rough on my end, but I think you'll get through it. And then uh, just get through the intro, the little interview there, and then we'll jump right into the book. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Another World Audiobooks. So happy to have you here as always, but not as always. I have a special guest, special treat for you. Very happy to have on the podcast here today an awesome voice, a a vocal talent to be sure. Someone who uh, we've done a project before together, which was a blast. Uh, A a member of the cast from the Christmas Carol audio drama, Mr. Alex Legassi. Alex, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Always great to be back and working with you. Yeah, I'm so, so stoked about this. Uh, so <laughs> people who have been listening to the podcast recently, um, I don't think you would know this actually at this point, Alex, but um, I actually brought back on uh, Mr. Sam Collins, who was okay. uh, also part of the Christmas Carol uh, troupe and also Miss awesome. Nikki Brown, uh, who came yes. on and uh, did uh, did some books. So you're the you're the third narrator to come on the show. Um, awesome. besides myself, which is uh, super cool. I'm just always excited when I can introduce the audience to some other vocal actors out there that are just doing awesome stuff. So uh, welcome back. And thank you uh, very much. Yeah, just wanted to kind of introduce you, uh, reintroduce you to the audience, and then also kind of talk about what uh, what they're getting into here with this new <laughs> book that we're bringing on. So awesome. uh, maybe for those who didn't listen to the Christmas Carol audio drama, and if you haven't, go back and do it because it's amazing. Absolutely. Um, but <laughs> for those who didn't catch that, um, why don't you just tell people who you are and uh, all, all that good stuff, a little introduction here. Sure. Uh, my name is Alex Legassi. I do audiobooks, character work, uh, kind of just anything and any everything I can do to kind of get myself out there. This has really been a passion project of mine that I decided to tackle head on uh, kind of when the world shut down about two years ago now. Uh, I figured, you know what, I've been wanting to do it forever. Now's the time. I got nothing but time on my hands. So let's go for it. And it's really taken me some incredible places. Um, so it's just, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's, it's absolutely yeah. a ton of fun. That's awesome. So how did you get like started or like, what, what gave you, cause I think for a lot of people, like they listen to audiobooks or they you right. know, watch YouTube channels that have narration or whatever, they're like, Oh, that's cool. They don't actually think about it. There's somebody behind there doing that. I want to do that. Like that, <laughs> yeah. where did that thought come from? How did that pop into your head? Um, it, it was kind of one of those things, um, like as a kid watching like Mel Blanc and all the great voice actors, you know, bringing characters to life. And I really wanted to marry that with my passion of books. You know, ever, ever since I was a kid, I taught myself how to read. Uh, I think in kindergarten, I was reading, you know, chapter books and just eating up every bit of literature I could. So I figured this is a great way to marry two passions together. And uh, I did a lot of research, you know, um, just looking up different sites and places. Um, I started on ACX and just kind of put myself out there. Uh, A couple people were great, gave me some breaks and were like, hey, yeah, we'll work with you. And it just kind of snowballed from there. Um, Now I just kind of get to pick and choose projects, which is always a lot of fun. Uh, In the beginning, it was kind of just, I'll take on anything and everything (laughs) just to kind of help perfect the craft a little bit. Um. And now it's it's just a lot of fun bringing, you know, authors written words to life and kind of putting a little bit of myself into these characters as well. That's awesome. And I apologize to the audience. Um, I generally uh, try to schedule recordings when uh, when the baby's either asleep or, <laughs> or not in, in the house. Um, so you just you, you can't control for, for baby factors. But no, uh, no. <laughs> this didn't work out this time. So apologize for that background <laughs> noise. But you know that the, the audio books are, are, are high quality if the intros yes. are a little bit less. Sometimes. <laughs> uh, well, that is really cool. Yeah. So um, what is what would you say is one of your favorite projects? I know it's like picking your favorite child which i guess you know for you at this point is probably pretty easy since you only have one but um right. what, what is a, an audiobook or a project that you've come across that's just been uh just one of your your favorites or just a, a character or a story that really just uh took things to the next level for you right um there was one project i did earlier on um it was it was oh shoot i'm trying to th- i'm blanking on the name a little bit but it was more of a murder mystery story um, it was kind of fun because I got to talk in a British accent. 
And so I nice. really had to research different ways to differentiate a British accent. So it wasn't just all the same. Hello there. Hello there. Hello there. <laughs> and, and you can really bring the characters into it. And it, it was just it was a really cool story. Um, in terms of a favorite character, um, I'm working on a current series right now. It is uh, the City of Cost series. And I play a character, uh, Core, who's kind of like a mix between Han Solo and uh, James Bond. And it, it's kind of neat because as I read the character on the page, I notice a lot of similarities. Not that I'm saying I'm, you know, Han Solo or, or James Bond, but um, there. Cer- certain there. aspects of the character where you learn more behind the bravado of this character. Um, mm. it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot, a lot nice. of fun. That is awesome. Yeah, that that is uh, one of the things uh, talking with uh, Mr. Sam Collins, who is uh, recently a guest uh, narrator on the podcast, and his just his effortless, like just perfectly smooth <laughs> British accent. It's like, oh man, <laughs> it makes me yeah. so self conscious about any time I try it. But <laughs> yeah, that that is it's one a of the fun one. parts. But yeah, yeah, it's one of the, one of the fun parts about narrating is like you get to do that research and kind of put mm-hmm. figure out how to to make it sound legitimate and all that sort of thing. And Absolutely. it is a, a really fun way it. to yeah give give the flavor to the uh to the different characters and stuff so right that's that's great so you're working right now on a lot of different things like we were talking about before we started recording um mm-hmm. what is kind of is there anything that you could kind of point people to that's uh, kind of current work that, that you'd like people to check out or sounds like you do some youtube narration and stuff like I, that so i do some youtube some narration um Unfortunately, the, the channel's not up. They want to kind of build a bank. So once oh, that nice. comes out, it's a movie review channel. Um, oh, nice. Yes. So name to be decided. I just kind of work on it. We've gone over some movies like Predator, uh, Pulp Fiction, uh, Godfather, just just a nice. couple of movies. Just kind of break them down into 10-minute little chunks. So in case you're a little crunch for time and you want to get the general gist of a movie, but you don't have time to sit for two hours. We break it down into uh, a fun infographic review. Um, Currently, I'd like to point people to the audiobook series that I just mentioned, uh, The City of Cost. You can find it on Amazon. Great series. Uh, I get to work with a bunch of awesome, awesome uh, voice actors. Each character is its own narrator in their own chapters. Oh, wow. So um, I get to work as Core, and then there's Ellie, there's Zach as different characters, and a different voice actor narrates that chapter. Nice. Oh man, yes. definitely have to check that out. I will get the link from you so that I can put that in the show notes. So if people want Absolutely. to check that out, uh, it's just a great way to support uh, the people that are, you know, doing, doing the stuff and bringing you free stuff, <laughs> the free, free <laughs> audiobooks here on the podcast. Like go, go ahead and support what Alex is doing. It's just uh, some, a great way to, to pass things along there. So uh, let us talk Alex about mm-hmm. this book that you chose. I have yes. to admit this is completely foreign to me. Okay. <laughs> if anybody's okay. listened to the podcast, we've done 12 audiobooks, I think, at least 12 audiobooks on this podcast. And I think the nearest we've ever gotten to any kind of like horror genre is Frankenstein, which okay. uh, I was not a fan of, <laughs> I oh, have really? to be honest. I, really? I gritted my teeth throughout that book. <laughs> I did not enjoy it whatsoever. And it's a tough read. It- Oh man, it was something. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I guess if anybody's listened to this podcast for a while, I've had requests for for some things, uh, different horror things. It's just it's generally not my speed. So I guess that was why I was kind of happy that uh, you were like, "Hey, I'll take this on. Uh, <laughs> I'll bite the bullet for you." <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, we get to, and therefore, you know, if if you love horror, you can you can thank Alex for it. If if you don't like it, then uh, you know you can uh, you wait, wait for me one. to come back. As, <laughs> uh, but I guess this, I wouldn't call this like this isn't hardcore horror. Uh, let's why don't you tell people what book you chose, why you chose okay. it and kind of what what we're what they're in for here. All right. So uh, the book I chose is The King in Yellow. Um, it is more of a cosmic horror. So it's not, you know, scary monster going to lurk under your bed type of thing. It's more about these cosmic entities that kind of play with human emotion. Um, I, 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 a big fan, you know, of HP Lovecraft, and this is kind of considered that Lovecraftian horror, although this was written before Lovecraft was writing his books, but they still follow that same vein of these, uh, cosmic entities, these deep, dark, you know, secret pockets of our universe where these truly evil creatures 
live to kind of play with humankind and uh, thrive on driving people mad and, and kind of feeding off of that. <laughs> Um, so if you're into that, this is yeah, this is going to be right up that alley. Um, and it, I was kind of drawn to this story because uh, as I was doing my research into it and just kind of learning a little bit more about it and kind of like the tone. So when I start, you know, really diving into the narration of it, I can capture that tone perfectly. It, it, the King in Yellow is literally sprinkled throughout all types of pop culture references, TV shows. Um, I don't know mm. if you're familiar with True Detective season one. Um, the King in Yellow is kind of like a driving force behind that whole season. So if you haven't checked out that huh. season, I'd recommend it. One of the greatest seasons of television you could ever watch. Um, so it, it, it's kind of neat to dive into that side of horror where more of the darker aspects of humanity is what's driving the yeah. horror instead of like a, were mm. a werewolf or a vampire. Um, yeah. So I'm excited nice. to bring it to life. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. When did you first come across this book? Like, was it something you read in school or? Um, I, I think I was doing a deep dive on YouTube. Uh, you know, a around this time of year, I always like to go into like these, these horror things, top 10 horror books, top 10 <laughs> horror movies to kind of help get me in the, halloween fall festive mood um and i stumbled across it and then it, i was kind of interested in in the aspect of these beings just kind of floating around they're, they're they don't conform to the judeo-christian uh concept of god and the devil but they're still out there and it was it just like i said i, I really love that dynamic of we are really our own worst enemies and and these this mm. book kind of really points that out in a big big way. I don't want to give away too yeah. much, but yeah, <laughs> tune in for it, big people. <laughs> All right, <laughs> cool. So uh, what what other stuff? I like to kind of just flesh out the uh, the the narrators here a little bit. Give the little sure. people a little bit of a, a background on you as far as um you know other other things i mean uh, they can kind of see us as we're just a voice you know this is, right. we're actually we are humans and, and people yes. don't necessarily last know time that, i so. checked <laughs> last time we checked uh <laughs> so yeah any any uh background or uh, kind of some just you know how, how you know where, where you're from ish and uh yeah. kind of what your your story is so uh i'm i'm currently living in uh connecticut born and raised um I have been doing personal training for the last decade. I currently work in um, a center for development, developmentally delayed adults, um, kind of working fitness with them, teaching them routines to kind of keep them healthy in their lifestyles. Um, so that that's kind of my passion outside of the recording booth. Um, oh, wow. And now I'm, I'm a, a new dad. I just had a, my son born a couple weeks ago. And so now that that's taken up a lot of my time and focus. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> that, that's pretty Wrong much in a, in, a, in a nutshell. I mean, I mean, I'm a little sleep deprived, so it's kind of hard, hard to pick and choose, you know, <laughs> what, what's about me. Like, cause at this point it's who am I? But, um, yeah, but that, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Nice. Nice. That is, that's really cool. How, how did you get started with the working with the, the people in need there? So, uh, through the 10 years of personal training, I had, um, occasionally gotten a chance to work with a developmentally delayed adult. Um, actually my first client was, uh, someone on the aut autism spectrum. So we've been working together for 10 years and it, it just, oh wow, I, I love the idea of, um, bettering their lives in a different way than most people would think of and introducing them to the world of fitness and just kind of seeing, yeah. you know, the, the light bulbs go off like, Oh wow, this is, this is fun. I, I enjoy doing this. And then, um, when I found out I was having my son, I decided to kind of get out of the personal training game and, uh, kind of settle down. And I, I always call it, you know, the gypsy lifestyle bouncing from gym to gym, working with uh, <laughs> clients here and there. So I figured, all right, I, I need something a little bit more, uh, permanent. And the first job I clicked on was working at this school. And I was like, awesome, awesome. And the rest is history. I've, I've been there now for almost a year. And it's probably some of the greatest work I've ever done. Nice. That is really cool. Well, it's really, really neat to just 
yeah <laughs> I, love, <laughs> I love working with with other narrators and and just being able to, to work with people who are, are you know making a difference and stuff that's really cool so um yeah thanks for your investment in other people like that it's really really awesome no problem so no problem i love it awesome well, Alex, I really appreciate, again, you coming on the show and being willing to do this guest narration. I'm so stoked for everybody problem. to dive into this. Um, like I said, you know, it's it's probably not a book I would have picked, but there's, <laughs> you know, hundreds and hundreds of people listening to this podcast, and I bet not all of them uh, necessarily approve of all my my choices <laughs> of books in the uh, past. So getting, Different strokes getting for different guys- folks. Yeah, exactly. And a little little taste of uh, something else, something different. And if you like it, I want to hear from you. So get in touch with <laughs> us. Uh, all the links for social media and all that sort of thing are going to be down in the show notes. Check those out. Um, I'll also be putting all the links to check out Alex and his work, um, especially the, the audiobook series he's working on and the YouTube channel. Sounds Once cool. it's up, we can put all the links to all the different stuff in there. So make sure to check that out. And uh, yes, thanks again, Alex. Not a problem. Not a problem. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this. Ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned. Uh, Some awesome stuff is coming your way. All right, now without further ado, I give you The King in Yellow, narrated by Alex Legassi. The King in Yellow by Robert W. Chambers. The King in Yellow is dedicated to my brother. Along the shore, the cloud waves break. The twin suns sink behind the lake. The shadows lengthen in Carcosa. Strange is the night where black stars rise, and strange moons circle through the skies. But stranger still is lost Carcosa. Songs that the Hyades shall sing, where flap the tatters of the king, must die unheard in dim Carcosa. Song of my soul, my voice is dead. Die thou unsung, as tears unshed. Shall dry and die in lost Carcosa. Casilda's Song in The King in Yellow, Act 1, Scene 2. The Repairer of Reputations 1. Ne rayons pas la feu, leur folie dure plus long temps que la notre. Voilà. Toute la différence. Toward the end of the year 1920, the government of the United States had practically completed the program, adopted during the last months of President Winthrop's administration. The country was apparently tranquil. Everybody knows how the tariff and labor questions were settled. The war with Germany, incident on that country's seizure of the Samoan Islands, had left no visible scars upon the republic and the temporary occupation of Norfolk by the invading army had been forgotten in the joy over repeated naval victories and the subsequent ridiculous plight of General von Gartenlaub's forces in the state of New Jersey. The Cuban and Hawaiian investments had paid 100%, and the territory of Samoa was well worth its cost as a coaling station. The country was in a superb state of defense. Every coast city had been well supplied with land fortifications, The army, under the parental eye of the general staff, organized according to the Prussian system, had been increased to 300,000 men, with a territorial reserve of a million, and six magnificent squadrons of cruisers and battleships patrolled the six stations of the navigable seas, leaving a steam reserve amply fitted to control home waters. The gentlemen from the West had at least been constrained to acknowledge that a college for the training of diplomats was as necessary as law schools are for the training of barristers. Consequently, we were no longer represented abroad by incompetent patriots. The nation was prosperous. Chicago, for a moment paralyzed after a second great fire, had risen from its ruins, white and imperial, and more beautiful than the white city which had been built for its plaything in 1893. Everywhere, good architecture was replacing bad, and even in New York, a sudden craving for decency had swept away a great portion of the existing horrors. Streets had been widened, properly paved and lighted, trees had been planted, squares laid out, elevated structures demolished, and underground roads built to replace them. The new government buildings and barracks were fine bits of architecture, and the long system of stone keys which completely surrounded the island had been turned into parks, which proved a godsend to the population. The subsidizing of the state theater and state opera brought its own reward. The United States National Academy of Design was much like European institutions of the same kind. Nobody envied the Secretary of Fine Arts, either his cabinet position or his portfolio. The Secretary of Forestry and Game Preservation had a much easier time, 
thanks to the new system of national mounted police. We had profited well by the latest treaties with France and England. The exclusion of foreign-born Jews as a measure of self-preservation, the settlement of the new independent Negro state of Sawanee, the checking of immigration, the new laws concerning naturalization, and the gradual centralization of the power and the executive all contributed to national calm and prosperity. When the government solved the Indian problem and squadrons of Indian cavalry scouts in native costume were substituted for the pitiable organizations tacked on to the tail of skeletonized regiments by a former Secretary of War, the nation drew a long sigh of relief. When, after the colossal Congress of Religions, bigotry and intolerance were laid in their graves and kindness and charity began to draw warring sects together, many thought the millennium had arrived, at least in the New World, which, after all, is a world by itself. But self-preservation is the first law, and the United States had to look on in helpless sorrow as Germany, Italy, Spain, and Belgium writhed in the throes of anarchy, while Russia, watching from the Caucasus, stooped and bound them one by one. In the city of New York, the summer of 1899 was signalized by the dismantling of the elevated railroads. The summer of 1900 will live in the memories of New York people for many a cycle. The Dodge statue was removed in that year. In the following winter began that agitation for the repeal of the laws prohibiting suicide which bore its final fruit in the month of April, 1920, when the first government lethal chamber was opened on Washington Square. I had walked down that day from Dr. Archer's house on Madison Avenue, where I had been as a mere formality. Ever since that fall from my horse four years before, I had been troubled at time with pains in the back of my head and neck, but now for months they had been absent and the doctor sent me away that day saying there was nothing more to be cured in me. It was hardly worth his fee to be told that. I knew it myself. Still, I did not grudge him the money. What I minded was the mistake which he made at first. When they picked me up from the pavement where I lay unconscious and somebody had mercifully sent a bullet through my horse's head, I was carried to Dr. Archer, and he, pronouncing my brain affected, placed me in his private asylum where I was obliged to endure treatment for insanity. At last he decided that I was well, and I, knowing that my mind had always been as sound as his, if not sounder, paid my tuition, as he jokingly called it, and left. I told him smiling that I would get even with him for his mistake, and he laughed heartily and asked me to call once in a while. I did so, hoping for a chance to even up accounts, but he gave me none, and I told him I would wait. The fall from my horse had fortunately left no evil results. On the contrary, it had changed my whole character for the better. From a lazy young man about town, I had become active, energetic, temperate, and above all, oh, above all else, ambitious. There was only one thing which troubled me. I laughed at my own uneasiness, and yet it troubled me. During my convalescence, I had bought and read for the first time The King in Yellow. I remember after finishing the first act that it occurred to me that I had better stop. I started up and flung the book into the fireplace. The volume struck the barred grate and fell open on the earth in the firelight. If I had not caught a glimpse of the opening words in the second act, I should never have finished it. But as I stooped to pick it up, my eyes became riveted to the open page, and with a cry of terror, or perhaps it was a joy so poignant that I suffered in every nerve, I snatched the thing out of the coals and crept shaking to my bedroom, where I read it and reread it, and wept, and laughed, and trembled with a horror which at times assails me yet. This is the thing that troubles me, for I cannot forget Carcosa, where black stars hang in the heavens, where the shadows of men's thoughts lengthen in the afternoon, when the twin suns sink into the lake of Hali, and my mind will bear forever the memory of the pallid mask. I pray God will curse the writer, as the writer has cursed the world with this beautiful, stupendous creation terrible in its simplicity, irresistible in its truth, a world which now trembles before the king in yellow. When the French government seized the translated copies which had just arrived in Paris, London, of course, became eager to read it. It is well known how the book spread like an infectious disease from city to city, from continent to continent, barred out here, confiscated there, denounced by press and pulpit censored even by the most advanced of literary anarchists. No definite principles had been violated in those wicked pages. No doctrine promulgated. No convictions outraged. 
It could not be judged by any known standard, yet, although it was acknowledged that the supreme note of art had been struck in the king in yellow, all felt that human nature could not bear the strain, nor thrive on words in which the essence of purest poison lurked. The very banality and innocence of the first act only allowed the blow to fall afterward with more awful effect. It was, I remember, the 13th day of April, 1920, that the first government lethal chamber was established on the south side of Washington Square, between Worcester Street and South Fifth Avenue. The block, which had formerly consisted of a lot of shabby old buildings used as cafes and restaurants for foreigners, had been acquired by the government in the winter of 1898. The French and Italian cafes and restaurants were torn down. The whole block was enclosed by gilded iron railing and converted into a lovely garden with lawns, flowers, and fountains. In the center of the garden stood a small white building, severely classical in architecture and surrounded by thickets of flowers. Six iconic columns supported the roof, and the single door was of bronze. A splendid marble group of the fates stood before the door, the work of a young American sculptor, Boris Yvonne, who had died in Paris when only 23 years old. The inauguration ceremonies were in progress as I crossed University Place and entered the square. I threaded my way through the silent throng of spectators, but was stopped at 4th Street by a cordon of police. A regiment of United States Lancers were drawn up in the hollow square around the lethal chamber. On a raised tribune facing Washington Park stood the governor of New York, and behind him were grouped the mayor of New York and Brooklyn, the inspector general of police, the commandant of the state troops, Colonel Livingston, military aide to the president of the United States, General Blount, commanding at Governor's Island, Major General Hamilton, commanding the garrison of New York and Brooklyn, Admiral Buffby of the fleet in the North River, Surgeon General Lansford, the staff of the National Free Hospital, Senators Wise and Franklin of New York, and the Commissioner of Public Works. The Tribune was surrounded by a squadron of hussars of the National Guard. The governor was finishing his reply to the short speech of the Surgeon General. I heard him say, The laws prohibiting suicide and providing punishment for any attempt at self-destruction have been repealed. The government has seen fit to acknowledge the right of man to end an existence which may have become intolerable to him through physical suffering or mental despair. It is believed that the community will be benefited by the removal of such people from their midst. Since the passage of this law, the number of suicides in the United States has not increased. Now the government has determined to establish a lethal chamber in every city, town, and village in the country. It remains to be seen whether or not that class of human creatures from whose desponding ranks new victims of self-destruction fall daily will accept the relief thus provided. He paused and turned to the white lethal chamber. The silence in the streets was absolute. There a painless death awaits him who can no longer bear the sorrows of this life. If death is welcome, let him seek it there. Then quickly turning to the military aid of the president's household, he said, I declare the lethal chamber open. And again, facing the vast crowd, he cried in a clear voice, Citizens of New York and the United States of America, through me the government declares the lethal chamber to be open. The solemn hush was broken by a sharp cry of command. The squadron of hussars filed after the governor's carriage. The lancers wheeled and formed along Fifth Avenue to wait for the commandant of the garrison, and the mounted police followed them. I left the crowd to gape and stare at the white marble death chamber, and, crossing South Fifth Avenue, walked along the western side of that thoroughfare to Bleecker Street. Then I turned to the right and stopped before a dingy shop which bore the sign, Hauberk, Armorer. I glanced in at the doorway and saw Hauberk busy in his little shop at the end of the hall. He looked up and, catching sight of me, cried in his deep, hearty voice, Come in, Mr. Costain. Constance, his daughter, rose to meet me as I crossed the threshold and held out her pretty hand, but I saw the blush of disappointment on her cheeks, and I knew that it was another Costain she had expected, my cousin, Louis. I smiled at her confusion and complimented her on the banner she was embroidering from a colored plate. Old Hauberk sat riveting the worn greaves of some ancient suit of armor, and the ting, ting, ting of his little hammer sounded pleasantly in the quaint shop. Presently, he dropped his hammer and fussed about for a moment with a tiny wrench. The soft clash of the mail sent a thrill of pleasure through me. I loved to hear the music of steel brushing against steel, 
the mellow shock of the mallet on thigh pieces and the jingle of chain armor. That was the only reason I went to see Hauberk. He had never interested me personally, nor did Constance, except for the fact of her being in love with Lewis. This did occupy my attention and sometimes even kept me awake at night. But I knew in my heart that all would come right, and that I should arrange their futures as I expected to arrange that of my kind doctor, John Archer. However, I should never have troubled myself about visiting them just then, had it not been, as I say, that the music of the tinkling hammer had for me this strong fascination. I would sit for hours listening and listening, and when a stray sunbeam struck the inlaid steel, the sensation it gave me was almost too keen to endure. My eyes would become fixed, dilating with a pleasure that stretched every nerve almost to breaking, until some movement of the old armor cut off the ray of sunlight. Then, still thrilling secretly, I leaned back and listened again to the sound of the polished rag, swish, swish, rubbing rust from the rivets. Constance worked with the embroidery over her knees, now and then pausing to examine more closely the pattern in the colored plate from the Metropolitan Museum. Who is this for? I asked. Albrecht explained that in addition to the treasures of the armor in the Metropolitan Museum, of which he had been appointed armorer, he also had charge of several collections belonging to rich amateurs. This was the missing greave of a famous suit which a client of his had traced to a little shop in Paris on the Quai d'Orsay. He, Hallberg, had negotiated for and secured the greave, and now the suit was complete. He laid down his hammer and read me the history of the suit, traced since 1450 from owner to owner until it was acquired by Thomas Stainbridge. When his superb collection was sold, this client of Hallberg's bought the suit, and since then the search for the missing greave had been pushed until it was almost by accident, located in Paris. Did you continue the search so persistently without any certainty of the grief being still in existence? I demanded. Of course, he replied coolly. Then for the first time I took a personal interest in Hallberg. It was worth something to you, I ventured. <laughs> no, he replied laughing. My pleasure in finding it was my reward. Have you no ambition to be rich? I asked, smiling. My one ambition is to be the best armorer in the world, he answered gravely. Constance asked me if I had seen the ceremonies at the lethal chamber. She herself had noticed cavalry passing up Broadway that morning and had wished to see the inauguration. But her father wanted the banner finished, and she had stayed at his request. Did you see your cousin, Mr. Castain, there? She asked with the slightest tremor of her soft eyelashes. No, I replied carelessly. Lewis's regiment is maneuvering out in Westchester County. I rose and picked up my hat and cane. Are you going upstairs to see the lunatic again? Laughed old Hallberg. If Hallberg knew how I loathe that word, lunatic, he would never use it in my presence. It rouses certain feelings within me which I do not care to explain. However, I answered him quietly. I think I shall drop in and see Mr. Wilde for a moment or two. Poor fellow, said Constance with a shake of her head. It must be hard to live alone year after year, poor, crippled, and almost demented. It is very good of you, Mr. Castain, to visit him as often as you do. I think he's vicious, observed Hallberg, beginning again with his hammer. I listened to the golden tinkle on the grieve plates. When he had finished, I replied, no, he is not vicious, nor is he in the least demented. His mind is a wonder chamber from which he can extract treasures that you and I would give years of our life to acquire. Hallberg laughed. I continued a little impatiently. He knows history as no one else could know it. Nothing, however trivial, escapes his search. And his memory is so absolute, so precise in details, that were it known in New York that such a man existed, the people could not honor him enough. Nonsense, muttered Hauberk, searching on the floor for a fallen rivet. Is it nonsense? I asked, managing to suppress what I felt. Is it nonsense when he says that the tacits and cussards of the enameled suit of armor, commonly known as the prince's emblazoned, can be found among a mass of rusty theatrical properties, broken stoves and rag pickers' refuse in Garrett and Pell Street? Hauberk's hammer fell to the ground but he picked it up and asked, with a great deal of calm, how I knew that the tacits and left cussard were missing from the prince's emblazoned. 
I did not know until Mr. Wilde mentioned it to me the other day. He said they were in the garret of 998 Pell Street. Nonsense, he cried, but I noticed his hand trembling under his leathern apron. Is this nonsense, too? I asked pleasantly. Is it nonsense when Mr. Wilde continually speaks of you as the Marquis of Avonshire and of Miss Constance? I did not finish, for Constance had started to her feet with terror written on every feature. Halberk looked at me and slowly smoothed his leather apron. That is impossible, he observed. Mr. Wilde may know a great many things. About armor, for instance, and the princes emblazoned, I interposed, smiling. Yes, he continued slowly. About armor also? Maybe. But he is wrong in regards to the Marquis of Avonshire, who, as you know, killed his wife's traducer years ago and went to Australia where he did not long survive his wife. Mr. Wilde is wrong, murmured Constance. Her lips were blanched, but her voice was sweet and calm. Let us agree, if you please, that in this one circumstance, Mr. Wilde is wrong, I said. Thank you so much for listening today. I hope you're enjoying these special guest uh, narrator appearances and all the awesome audiobook content that I get to bring you through that. Again, another huge, huge, huge thank you to Alex. He's just volunteering because he enjoys uh, the craft and loves doing this and uh, likes sharing stuff with you guys. So uh, give him some love. uh, Say thank you. Um, If you want to share this episode, that's a great way to just get that exposure going for him. I know he would really appreciate it. So just share it around and spread the word. Uh, As always, a huge the shout out and thank you to our amazing patron patrons um to sharon ariella and brianna thank you guys you make this podcast possible if you want to become a patron go to another world audiobooks and you can sign up there there's some awesome perks and uh yeah it just really helps the podcast keep going if you enjoy this um either telling other people about the podcast or sharing it or uh just becoming a, a patron are wonderful ways to help keep it going and help me to be able to bring on more awesome narrators like alex and like sam and uh like nikki thank Thank you so much to each one of them again for coming on and uh yeah if you're enjoying this let me know i'd love to hear from you we will catch you next week with more from the king in yellow and alex Legassi. so stay tuned <laughs>